I'm really delighted to welcome Dr. Emma Newport, who is a, a fellow senior lecturer in English, uh, but at the University of Sussex. So welcome to Emma. Emma's interests include 18th century attitudes to China uh, in Britain and women's roles in the exchange of ideas and objects. And Emma has very recently returned from a physical conference, I think, uh, in a series that she uh, co-convenes titled Women, Money and Markets 1600 to 1900. Uh, and Emma's currently working on an edited collection of essays of that name. Uh, and Dr. Newport's paper today is titled Substance, Sinology and Sonneteers, or Literature, Porcelain and Tea Cultures in the Late 18th Century. So I'll hand over to you, Emma. I'll just warn you that uh, we'll, we'll give you a call about 20 minutes in just as a sort of uh, a, time, uh, a, a time check, but really looking forward to what you have to say now. Thank you so much. Um, I've just shared my screen with you all. There's a QR code there because I've got some quite text heavy slides. And if you follow that QR code, um, you will be able to get uh, a PDF of the slides coming up, um, which will help hopefully uh, to contextualize what I'm saying. So today I'm going to speak to you about porcelain um, and its relationship to poetry. For me, porcelain represents high and low culture, is both art and object, its malleability of shape and colour during production, its portability and stability of shape once made, with its contradictory hardness and fragility, its potential for display and use, its combination of technological and artistic processes, all means that porcelain as a substance seems to function as a contradictory set of signs, able to carry multiple meanings in the way in which porcelain is made and finished, where it is from, where it ends up, and the context, whether of display or use or both, into which it is placed. Porcelain as a substance is the vessel through which past meets present, art meets science, east meets west, word meets object, and lip meets cup. Tea drink drinking, the function that is perhaps most closely associated with porcelain in, uh, sorry, in 18th century Britain is quotidian and demotic as well as elevated social ceremony. Porcelain is a vessel or portal and in its portability, porcelain carries with it cultural associations in which its long 18th century collectors were fascinated. As a substance, porcelain pieces appear to serve as fixed and tangible signs of China, each piece a metonym for the place, transported from its original context and inserted into a new one in European porcelain collections. Yet, as I will show, porcelain is an unstable sign, subject, for example, to reinscription. Collecting and displaying porcelain in the long 18th century was to form a chain of signification in which new meanings could be derived, leading to understanding through difference between each piece in its careful spacing in the arrangement. Lady Dorothea Banks, the collector about whom I'm talking today, deliberately saw a wide variety of ages and categories of porcelain, including salts she considered defective, ugly or fraudulent. Consequently, I argue that porcelain is always in a condition of Derridian difference. In his essay of the same name, the deliberate misspelling indicates the notion of deferral. In other words, the ideas that the idea that words and signs can never completely summon what they mean, but can only be defined through recourse to additional words from which they differ. As such, meaning is always deferred or stalled through an endless chain of signifiers, as with pieces of porcelain in a collection, which will never be completed. A second meaning occurs in the idea of the difference produced by espacement or spacing or the force that differentiates elements from one another and in so doing propagates binary oppositions and implied hierarchies that underpin meaning itself. Both senses of the word difference are important to reading the porcelain collection of the long 18th century. Kavanagh and Yonan have argued that a specific type of porcelain piece codes its signification. The teacup and teapot, for example, quote, does not function as a sign of good taste, but rather of a metamorphosis brought about by a magical process, one that takes the plain and useless and modifies them into something delightful and beautiful. In other words, 
it becomes a commodity, a fetish, an idol. Any suggestion then of porcelain's immutability, that it could be considered a fixed and stable sign, can be contested even when considering responses to porcelain from the long 18th century. We can turn, for example, to the Emperor Qianlong himself, who reigned from 1735 to 1796, and who highlighted the way in which, by adding to the decoration of a piece of porcelain, the poet upon porcelain is able to reinscribe the piece with a new or altered meaning by either retaining but adding to or by completely covering the decoration that was there before. Qianlong was infused by the way in which the, the surviving ancient porcelain signified the presence and the talent and glory of his ancestors and of China's past. As Yu Pei Jin observes in Consummate Images, Emperor Qianlong's visions of the ideal kiln, the emperor added to porcelain that was thousands of years old his own poetic communications with his ancestors reading the porcelain as a signifier of the past, but also as alterable by poetic additions in the present, resulting in porcelain pieces that signify both past and present in the same piece. For the emperor, the porcelain pieces that he had decorated with his poetry possessed a dialogic quality, a vessel between past and present in conversation with the ghost of its makers and of his ancestors. Lady Dorothea Banks, wife of botanist jo Joseph, shared Qianlong's belief in porcelain communicating China's past achievements. But for Lady Banks, a piece of porcelain interplays between a past and present in which historic China might speak or not to modern European manufactories. As the Banks Dairy Book records in its many remarks upon the relationship between porcelain as art and porcelain as industry, it is clear that the ware is not the produce of Qin Tai Ching, but of some manufactory which has either ceased to work with, um, to work, or with which the Europeans have not any longer a communication. We can also see in the second quotation that we have uh, the idea of the forms of vessels may be communicated to British manufacturers by engravings, but the pure white, the beautiful colours, and the semi transparent brilliance of the glaze of chinaware can only be studied from the originals themselves which ladies best know how to arrange with taste and exhibit to advantage. In this way, Collecting China reflects what Qi Ming Yang observes in the performance of Murphy's play, The Orphan of China from 1759. Quote, there are two Chinas of vote, an ancient China of the play and a modern China of economic consequence, generating a set of affective responses that produces the conditions for theorizing as well as imagining the Western moral self. The Dairy Book is a unique account of the porcelain collection of Dorothea Banks, yoking sentiment to academic study. The document includes unpublished intimacies, such as the sonnets written by Joseph to Dorothea. In addition to a formal analysis of the porcelain collection as an aesthetic endeavor and source of scientific and industrial advancement. The Dairy Book is mostly a catalogue for a porcelain collection that no longer exists, and an encyclopedia or repository of some of the bank's family and others' knowledge about China, Chinese porcelain, ancient classical pottery, and European copies, collected through the international exchange of objects and letters between Englishmen in Britain, Europe, and China. The act of porcelain collecting turns the Banks family towards the nature and construction of the Western economic self and contrasts Chinese historicity with Western desire for emulation of antiquity, but through progress and scientific advancement. And should that fail, through industrial espionage. All the while porcelain is metonymically evoking the perfection of the substance and as a source of ambition, technologically and economically. In Lady Banks's record of her porcelain dairy and Stephen Weston's translation of a poem upon a teacup from her porcelain collection, we have an example of an early 19th century effort to recontextualize porcelain to resolve the gaps and erasures caused by the series of dispersals, dislocations, and destabilizations in the Derridian sense that occur in the globalized production, trade, transportation, collection, use, and display of porcelain. <laughs> 
ways of reading porcelain were complicated or obscured rather than clarified through the introduction of European knowledge of China gleaned from letters sent by those living in Canton and from accounts by earlier missionaries translated sometimes into two or three European languages before reaching English, embellished, of course, with the creative interpretation of their translators. Every long 18th century study of porcelain in England is not just unavoidably, but is in fact deliberately a creative critical one. So my paper today will consider the linguist Stephen Weston's A Specimen of Picturesque Poetry in Chinese. I promised on a tears, but I confess that that was more for the sibilance than its accuracy. Although I suggest that efforts in translation of Chinese poetry upon porcelain into English do evoke the sonnet in its unity of form and its single emotional and situational affect. To Stephen Weston then. He was a noted linguist who is perhaps most famous for attempting to translate the Greek portion of the Rosetta Stone. He was also an enthusiast for what he called Oriental languages, which included Chinese. Weston was a family friend as well as a scholar um, working for Dorothea Banks, who, and Dorothea Banks is someone who both Arlene Lees and I have demonstrated in previous publications, was a far more astute and dedicated student of porcelain than the declaration by Joseph Banks that she was a little old China mad. Now, sadly, we have lost Lady Banks's porcelain dairy and its myriad contents, but I imagine that it might have looked something like the picture on the screen right now. And the famous China mad letter to David Lance, the superintendent of the East India Company's Canton factory, when read in full states, quote, at Lady Banks' desire, I enclose to you the paper you will receive with this. She is a little old China mad, but she wishes to mix as much reason with her madness as possible. And so on her behalf, Banks asks a series of questions about Chinese porcelain's provenance, use, production, all in order to facilitate Lady Banks' deepening understanding of her porcelain collection. In service of this enlightenment, the translator Stephen Weston arrives to translate some of the Chinese poetry on her porcelain. Lady Banks' Porcelain Dairy and the accompanying dairy book help us to imagine the porcelain dairy as a space of sociability and as one for research, observation, analysis and reflection. Significantly, as I turn to a poem about tea upon one of Lady Banks' porcelain cups and bring in some Derrida to do so, I must remind you that Lady Banks' collection is entirely lost. The last known record of the collection is a 19th century stale. What we have then is the absent presence of the collection in the handwritten record of it, the dairy book, and in Weston's publication, a specimen of picturesque poetry in Chinese. Reading Lady Banks's dairy book and Stephen Weston's translation together, we can arrive at a new understanding of scholars' perception of China at this time, in which we see Banks and Weston recognizing that the apparent exoticism of China and its products are in fact the consequence of a process of exoticization on the part of European interpreters of Chinese exports. These are also economic fictions. Value is imagined as existing not only in porcelain's use value, but also in its authenticity, in its relation to Chinese labor, the, and to the invisible Chinese hands at work in the market, and to Chinese antiquity, whose ghostly absent presence is always haunting the porcelain vessel. I am basing my discussion today on the following quotation from the dairy book. We have adopted as ornaments, both to our furniture and dress, hideous phantoms. These hideous phantoms are not Chinese, but have been, according to the dairy book, conjured in European imaginations. This peculiar phrasing stood out to me. What if we read acts of translation and the economic relations represented by the fictile substance of porcelain as a form of hauntology in the Derridian sense. Now, De Derrida introduces the term hauntology in Spectres of Marx, published in 1993. In this work, Derrida sets out the situation of temporal and ontolo ontological disjunction in which presence, particularly socially and culturally, is replaced by a deferred non-origin. In other words, the non-origin non formed in our case by the fact that so few Europeans had visited China. And so as a place and set of ideas, China was largely invented and resided in European imaginations, 
conjured through the objects, both consumable and non, and the texts that travel to, between China and Europe. As Friedrich Jameson notes in his response to Derrida's Spectres of Marx in his essay entitled Marx's Purloined Letter, quote, Derrida's work begins by turning on the implied ontology of Hamlet's cry, the time is out of joint, and the structure of the act of conjuring as such, calling forth, allaying, conspiring, now set the stage for what follows. And porcelain is always out of joint for the time, conjuring the past and elsewhere, haunting European mantelpieces and porcelain dairies. Madness and reason, a Hamlet-like concern, and which Lady Banks is keen to mix together, brings us neatly back to Derrida's hauntology in Spectres of Marx. The homophone ontology, ontology works far better in the French, and thus immediately points to the destabilizing effects of translation as signs are pulled further apart in their more unlike sounds. And in fact, Derrida discusses the very problem of translation and the ghosts and fantasies it produces in his opening remarks upon the challenge of translating Marx from German. Derrida admits that, quote, one effaces the semantics or the lexicon of the spectre, as translations often do, the values deemed to be more or less equivalent, phantasmagorical, hallucinatory, fantastic, imaginary, and so on. Now, in its simplest terms, ontology, seeks the classification and explanation of entities. It is about the object of inquiry or what you set out to examine. And this brings us to the classifications that we find in the dairy book. The 10th appendix of Lady Banks's dairy book attempts to classify and name the different types of porcelain within it. And that she has attempted to introduce a, a general kind of classification into her dairy and has succeeded beyond her expectation but how far it may be useful to others is a matter of doubt. No collectress can possess more than a very few sorts of the multitude sent forth. Every collection, therefore, will have pieces distinct and distinguishable from all others. Add to that anomalies, shards, forgeries, as well as those pieces in opposition to Lady Banks's taste, all were held in the collection. Retention of irregularity within the collection acted as a major method of constructing authenticity through a process of comparison. As the dairy book notes, all attempts at such an arrangement is hopeless a task as to enumerate the stars visible in Herschel's telescope or to count the grains of sand scattered on the, on the shores of the sea. In relation to the professed impossibility of categorization, coll a colliding reading of substance, shape, shine, color, and sound must be undertaken in conjunction with the deciphering of the mark, haunted always by the unseen hand or hands of the maker and the author. Questionable authenticity and practices in fraudulence and fakery concerned Dorothea greatly. But to Weston. In his opening to Fragments of Oriental Literature, written at the same time as he is working on Banks's porcelain, Wesson describes his proposed methodology for the amateur translator of Chinese, which first captures the struggle to derive meaning from Chinese texts and the multiplicity of meanings that can emerge in the espace between the marks. As he says, the Chinese tongue is to a European who has never been in China, more a language to be acquired by the eye than the ear. And then he talks about forcing, metaphorically forcing away through the hedge of aloes and prickly pears with which the language is fenced. Even here, the spiky aloes and prickly pears, we can think of Derrida's Spectres of Marx and his introduction of the spiky Anquiet Pork Epique, the fretful porpentine, in his use of Hamlet throughout the volume, um, pointing to the impossibility of translating Shakespeare's word porpentine into French as well as pointing to the invention and slips that occur in doing so. In Weston's discussion of Banks's cup in A Specimen, we first have a transcription of what Weston calls Chinese marks into English words, reading from top to bottom, right to left in vertical lines. Weston translates each of these characters headed English, retaining approximately the same shape as the characters in the following manner on the subsequent page, as you can see on the slide. But then he goes on to create a new version of the poem in which the word order and the character's meaning is transformed into an English poem 
into something approximating a half-finished sonnet, not having quite concluded the octave or arrived yet at the volta. Weston's anglicised poem evokes European visions, um, versions of Chinaware, creating tropic and orientalized scenes. And his poem departs significantly from the original emphasis of the Chinese poem, which focuses upon the thingness of the thing. The Chinese poem refers to the cup, the timing of tea drinking, the ritualistic patterns with which it was associated. By comparison, Weston's anglicized version gives us a narrator and an unknown figure to whom the poem is addressed in the second person, you. Who are these apparitions? On a linguistic level, this could, I suppose, be answered through English's emphasis on the noun phrase and the subject-object relations it requires or implies in the passive. Has the translation become, in the words of Derrida, phantasm phantasmagorical, hallucinatory, fantastic, imaginary? Who are these apparitions who haunt the text? Well, they are figments of European imagination, but also perhaps maybe they are the ghost of its makers, Western conjuring them in order to enter a dialogue with the porcelain's past and the phantasms that it both contains and bring forth. We have too the Derridean slip between the words vassal and vessel, one of subordination, the other of containment, as with the slip between hauntology, ontology, vassal and vessel carry with it phantasms of the European imagination. Got four or five more minutes, Emma. That's great, I'm in my final furlong. That vast and heterogeneous China is somehow subordinated and understood, imbibed in the teacup on the tea table. Western's anglicized version is haunted by the European vision of the Oriental as subject, place and person. The poem ironically becomes one of those hideous phantoms against which the Dairy Book warned. Western's poem as a version conjures forth such European apparitions as the cup is now imagined as a vessel for Su Shong tea, one of the most popularly drunk teas in London. An important note, Su Shong is an inexpertly um, transliteration or is an inexpertly transliterated uh, or anglicization um, of Zhao Zhong or Xu Sheng. And I don't think that my pronunciation is any better. But Su Shong in Europe was black tea on the basis of the color of the imported leaf. Yet the Chinese named it red tea on the basis of the color of the brewed tea. And of course, as everyone here will already know, Su Shong was the most famous tea in London because its smoked leaves were easier to preserve during transportation. Whereas in China, there were many hundreds of variations of tea from fresh as well as dried leaves. The leaves in Weston's poem are mere burnt offerings, the ghost of real tea. Yet it is in the introduction of the unseen narrator and the insertion of the second person, you, that the apparition manifests and haunts the space between the marks inscribed upon porcelain in Chinese and in, in Chinese and Western's version. As Derrida remarks, the commodity thus haunts the thing and the haunting displaces itself like an anonymous silhouette or the figure of an extra who might be the principal character. Western's English version makes the poem about the consumer of the drink, the imported Souchong tea that epitomizes globalized trade, even while it erases its producers, rather than the poem complimenting the vessel and celebrating its production as the original porcelain poem does. Western adds bamboo and a Chinese bird. The Chinese poem on porcelain has been turned into a textual version of the scenes found on European made blue chinaware or the commercial commodities sent in vast volumes from the factories in Guangzhou or Old Canton to Europe, a global trade that could more thoroughly reduce its makers of the commodity to ghost. The sinologist Weston's version is a phantasm and a hauntological study of Lady Banks's porcelain cup. And to really emphasize this point, we see here that in many ways, what he's produced is something more like uh, Bowles's sonnet written chiefly on picturesque spots during a tour of Britain, this departure from uh, the original porcelain cup. And to conclude, if 
this had been in person, we were going to have an, uh, a handling session. But I have here, not sadly, Lady Banks's cup, but I can hold up for you um, an equivalent cup um, for you to, uh, to admire. Um, to give you a sense of its scale, this is my teacup um, compared to um, the kinds of cups that Lady Banks is collecting. So I will conclude there with my sense of Western giving us a hauntological study of Lady Banks's porcelain cup. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Emma. That was uh, fantastic and an incredible amount to, to, to listen to and, and take in. Uh, I'm going to start you with something simple, which is to, if you can stop your screen share, you'll be a bit bigger on the screen and maybe you can just show us your, uh, your teacup a bit more, hmm. kind of a, a, bit, a bit more time for people to see. And can you describe exactly what we're looking at, what, what this object is when it's from? And yes. As um, much as you know about it. Yeah. Well, yes. So I found it in uh, a little, a little uh, antique shop um, uh, up near Shrewsbury, funnily enough. Um, and this actually comes from 1730 and it's from a, um, the Camel shipwreck. Um, and what I find really interesting about it is um, we have the brown uh, glaze outside and, and the blue underglaze, which we're perhaps most familiar with. But something that perhaps the audience um, would like to appreciate is, is how delicate it is. And why I find it, this interesting is that one of the things I didn't get to talk about is that Banks, uh, Lady Banks is very interested in detecting authenticity through the sound and something that if you can hold it just right and, and ding it, it has a resonance, um, which by comparison, these do not. So um, this is a very faded, uh, heavier example. And then this is the one that really we all know. Um, this is an 1830s uh, blue and white, um, blue and white porcelain um, and this is what I feel um, the poem begins to evoke you know these sort of stereotypical scenes and the stereotypical porcelain and it contrasts very much with the the delicacy and fineness of um, the little cup but I will say that the picture that I put on my slides that sold for you know thousands my, my little cup I, I have to say was um, yeah, about a hundred pounds. <laughs> Fantastic. We've got a couple of questions coming in. Uh, uh, first of all, a kind of, I guess, a kind of a fairly practical but important archival question about Lady Banks's collection. Gina asks whether the sale catalogue exists, uh, whether it gives any clues such as descriptions, I suppose, values, manuscript editions, any, you know, anything like that that might help you to trace items in this collection? Yes, so um, if you go through the Natchbull papers um, and indeed the sales around the Natchbull estate, you can pick up um, bits of porcelain, but the problem was it wasn't sold in one complete collection. There is one sale where you can capture um, a, a fair number of pieces in, in the mid 19th century. But the great thing is, is that the dairy book provides you with a list and description of all of these pieces. So again, the sort of the hauntology uh, you know, resurrects itself um, because we have uh, the absent presence of the collection in the dairy book. And there's drawings, there's some beautiful um, drawings uh, available there as well. Um, and there we get some comparisons as well. So you have the idol of Ninefo in its various iterations um, being drawn alongside each other. And so you get a sense of the way in which the physical collection was being presented next to each other to construct these senses of difference in order to, to become more expert. But an interesting point is that and this is why it's so Deridian and wonderful. And I know I'm very Sussex for caring about Derrida, um, but it's great. <laughs> what's really interesting is that this, um, this book isn't really a book. It's sort of a bunch of leaves put together and some of it's bound and some of it's not. Um, but what happens is the more information they acquire, the more they realize they do not know. And there's a sense of almost becoming despairing of the project because, 
every piece of information they find out just merely uncovers more to know, more to understand. And it's sort of a, a sense of a growing anxiety and a sense of this project is a failure in some ways. I was, I, I mean, I am going to use the other questions in our Q&A box, but on that note, I was interested in the relationship between, if I'm not being entirely stupid, this is uh, Joseph Banks's wife, right? Yes. Uh, is, is there some kind of parodic or emulatory or, you know, admiring relationship between her typology or taxonomy of porcelain and her, her cataloguing of, of porcelain on the one hand and Banks's natural historical interest and attention to uh, botanical taxonomies in particular in, in his own work? Well, I mean, this is the interesting thing because it's handwritten. So most of it has been written in the very neat hand of um, Banks's um, assistant, uh, uh, William Cartlick. And then you get um, the hand of Joseph Banks in there as well. Um, so there's very much a sense of this being um, a collaboration. I think that the temptation is to go, well, this is, you know, this is Banks's hands all over it. Um, but by bringing in the evidence of the letters and he's very clearly communicating and gathering this information on her behalf, answering questions that she has raised. And throughout, um, there's a celebration of, of the role of ladies in, um, in providing manufacturers and the, stud, uh, and the study of porcelain with um, a new way of understanding and looking at the porcelain. So the difficulty is trying to fully detect um, Dorothea Banks's hand in there, and, and um, Arlene Nees and I have both sort of approached this text um, at similar times with different outcomes, mm -hmm. but I think read together, and I've linked them both um, in the Padlet, um, I, do, I do recommend reading um, Arlene's paper as well. I think it, it really helps. But yes, this is a collaborative project. But when you begin with a you know, picture of her favorite cow and it's called Phil Pale, and you do think, oh, is this going to be a, a parodic? No, it's very warm, it's very affectionate, and it is the celebration of their 27th um, anniversary. Um, and, it's, and in that sense, it's also a wonderful record of their relationship. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna read a, a slightly longer comment from uh, my colleague Markman at Queen Mary. Thanks, Emma, that was excellent. Porcelain is a really generative example for your analysis. This is not really a question, but an invitation to respond for which many apologies. But I was wondering, what I was wondering about is 18th century European porcelain. Uh, did banks collect porcelain from European factories such as Meissen or, or Bow? again, just down the road from me? Uh, and if so, did she display it alongside her China wares? Is European porcelain ontologically haunted in your sense by China as a deferred non-origin? I hope you're reading this as well as listening to it. Uh, I'm also into, you can probably use the Q&A box too. I'm also interested in European porcelain, which imitates Chinese forms, chinoiserie, and Chinese porcelain that adopts European design, export wares. Are such wares of transculturation interesting to your analysis at all? So, you know, you can take one of those or all of those. Thank uh, you so much, Marvin. And, I'm, I'm, and uh, thank you for your question. Um, I have read a lot of your works in, in different places and taught a lot of your works as well. So um, I, I appreciate the question. Um, yeah, so this is a question that, that the banks family really interested in. Um, the, <laughs> the European wares mostly derided as gaudy fantasies is the is the name attached to the European efforts and in fact a big part of the dairy book is about saying actually these older duller simpler but authentically Chinese ones are the ones that we should care about they might not be as gaudy and sparkly and um, colorful but th this is real porcelain and this is real history being conveyed and these sort of new um, facsimiles um, are, are only to be considered as a way to demonstrate through that comparison through that difference you know that you can expose and, and what it is in, in that sense is a sort of training manual for the eye and for the taste you know so to help cultivate connoisseur they use the word connoisseur re really interesting ways throughout the text um, in terms of the ones made for the export market, again, there is some discussion of that. Um, and uh, a lot of work is, it, it, well, a lot of work. There are references made to how you might tell the difference between export wear and, and real imperial rue wear, for example. Um, 
And again, there's this sort of account of the different tests that you could um, take, including she has this broken filigree um, and it's in itself, and she makes this point, or they make this point, that it's worthless because it's broken. You know, this is, no, this is not a valuable filigree piece, but they keep it in the collection because you can see how it's made through the fact that it's broken apart. So you can actually see the textures of the porcelain, the way the glaze has been um, added. And, and I thought that was really interesting as well. So she doesn't necessarily have it out on display, but she keeps it in a, you know, in a cupboard so that you can sort of bring it out and study it. So as a kind of different kind of anatomical or instructive uh, value, which is, yeah, really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, the skeleton of the porcelain in some yeah. way. Uh, we've got a question from my co-organiser, Romita. She's going to come in in a moment, but I just want to address this uh, question from Emily, just to maybe reiterate or explain a little bit more. How large was Lady Banks's collection and did she collect other kinds? Well, we've answered some of that. Did, did she collect other kinds of non-porcelain Chinese objects? Well, actually, that's the flip, isn't it, of Markman's question. Were there other Chinese things she collected and, and how large was it? So I'll let you answer that, then I'll let Romita come in with her question. Yeah, so um, we have the numbered pieces um, that she's listed. I, what we don't know is to what extent that was an absolutely comprehensive account. So she's obviously not working at the scale of, say, the Duchess of Portland. And we know this because we have letters and correspondence um, where Lady Banks attended one of the Portland sales and is picking up pieces. So she doesn't have the budget to kind of go for, you know, she's buying one or two pieces at a time. Um, but yes, uh, we've, you know, what she's numbered ranges in around about 100 pieces. Um, but we don't know if that is a, you know, an absolute list of every single piece. Um, and there are some that she talks about utterly, and she uses the word utterly, you know, casting out of her collection once she realizes it's, it's not what she thought it was. Um, so there's that sort of haunting as well. We don't really know what it is beyond the fact that she found, she worked out that it was not authentically what she thought it was. And so it's cast away. Um, have I answered all parts of that question? I think um, so. Non, oh, other, uh, yeah, other, other, other kinds of objects. I mean, they're a collecting family. Um, Sophia Banks, the, uh, uh, the sister, you know, she's, she's, I mean, possibly a modern day hoarder, you know, that's how we might see her collecting habits and vastly outnumbers um, uh, Dorothea Banks's collection. Um, yeah, I mean, she's interested in the Chinese taste. She's definitely um, interested in decorating her place. And there's a comment that Banks makes that, you know, she doesn't care for the fashion because she carries on decorating the Chinese taste when it's, you know, no longer the fashionable thing to do. So, but again, although in the natural papers, you can get some records of this and through the Banks archives, but mostly there, you know, a lot of Banks archives are in Australia, for example, um, knowing exactly what it looked like and, and how much of it there was. Um, not sure. Great. Uh, we, we are now low on time. There are a couple yes. more questions in the Q and A box that maybe Emma you can answer by text during the the break or the sure. video. But Romita, I'm going to let you have. We've got about two minutes before our next video, so I'm sure you'll have an excellent question that Emma won't be able to answer in two minutes. But but we'll give it a go. Now, Emma, I really enjoyed your presentation. This is not a question; it's a comment. I was super excited when you talked about hauntings because I had a whole section in my paper about the lost animals of the jungle mm. show up on paper as ghosts. Um, so I wanted to sort of pull your, your, uh, an observation about materiality. I wanted to pull back to the materiality of the porcelain because you just talked about broken pieces. And one of the things that immediately came to mind were the imperfections of porcelain as well, mm -hmm. right? These mm -hmm. chips and breaks that we tend to discard sometimes, right? But those are also the imprints of human hands long gone. So in many ways, they're actually playing to this idea of haunting as well. They're part of um, the, the continuum, right? Of haunting mm -hmm. the idea that others have touched, others have used, others have engaged, and those bodies are no longer with us but the, the imprints remain, right? So I just wanted to throw that in, toss that into the mix a little bit, toss that into the teacup, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I was listening to your paper and, and you know, I was making notes around also the transference of the animal into the imagination. I thought sort of the opposite 
but the same kind of ideas of kind of constructing through the imagination. I was, I, um, yeah, and so really interesting to me that you picked up on on um, hauntings in that way. Absolutely, and this is something I think um, the Dairy book again makes some reference to. And interesting how it ties in with Chin Long's own view of kind of this sort of sense of who's owned this and held it and used it, so whose lips have touched the cup, um, and creating that sense of these ghosts of of, of owners and makers past in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Great, thank you, Roma, for your comments. And Emma, thank you again for a really fabulous paper and uh, very full and genial answers and for bringing your teacups as well to, to show us. Uh, it was excellent. And I, I wish we could have passed them around. And I, I wish also you could hear us clapping. I don't think we've got reactions, but you can imagine us all uh, clapping uh, to thank you.